Um, so today, what we're going to be talking about uh, is some of the research that I've done over the past couple years on, um, uh, sorry, research that I've done on Erna Gunther, uh, who is an ethnographer and uh, anthropologist who actually worked for the University of Washington's anthropology department. Um, for decades in the early 20th century. Uh, I believe she retired sometime in the 1960s or 70s, but she spent an extensive period of time uh, out here on the Olympic Peninsula interviewing Squalum tribal elders. And uh, she actually published the Clallam Ethnography in 1927, uh, which at the time and still to this day is one of the, the best um, sort of summary works on, on Squalum culture, um, and history. Um, but the reason I wanted to give this presentation was to kind of give a little bit of a more in-depth look um, at the actual uh, information that was given to Erna by tribal informants in the 1920s. Um, Erna Gunther did some amazing work, but Dr. Gunther was very much a scientist. And so what she did was she went out, she accumulated as much data as she could from various informants and sources and then she sort of synthesized all of that material down into what became the Clallam Ethnography. Um, and so what happened was, you know, when you're boiling all of that data down into a report, you lose a lot of the more personal information, who the individuals were who were giving the information, what individuals, specific individuals they were talking about with reference to historic events, um, and some of the, the, the more interesting details. So what I wanted to talk about today was um, a couple years ago, we went over to the University of Washington archives where they have Erna Gunther's um, collections. And in those collections, they've got uh, five of her little uh, spiral bound field notebooks. We had those scanned and then we, I actually sat down and transcribed four of those five notebooks um, into a Microsoft Word document that we could use for research purposes. Um, and you'll see in a couple of the slides that I show you, um, it, it was important to transcribe it because her handwriting and her shorthand is a little difficult to read in places. So it, it took me a couple years of chipping away at it, uh, but it really has turned into kind of a gold mine of information on the Squalum people. Uh, and I wanted to share some of that with you all today. Um, so, and I'll talk more about some of these images, but you can see a picture of Dr. Gunther there on the right side of your screen. Um, she was actually out here on the Olympic Peninsula between 1920 and 1923 is when she did her uh, primary interviews with um, the Squalum informants. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about who those folks were. Um, she, she did come back out, she actually, so she worked with the Squalum, she then uh, later on worked with the Macaw, and she worked with quite a few tribes around the Salish Sea on different ethnobotanical and ethnographic um, research that she was doing. In her time in the 1920s working with the Squalum, um, out of the uh, six or seven informants that she had, uh, the majority of those were actually Jamestown Squalum tribal ancestors. And the reason for that was her research was um, primarily centered around Chiquing, the Squalum village that was at Washington Harbor, um, and interviewing folks who lived at that village. So you can see actually some of them circled in this picture. Um, Mary Hunter Hall in the white dress seated in the middle row on the far left. Uh, I've got the folks circled in red here with the formants. Um, Mary Hall Hunter Wood was actually um, uh, from the Hall family and they were from Discovery Bay. Uh, she moved over to Washington Harbor and then later to Jamestown in the 1890s. Um, Mary Hall uh, first married Martin Hunter, then she la later married uh, Dan Wood and has descendants through both of those lines who are uh, Jamestown tribal citizens today. Um, directly below her, seated in the bottom row with the striped uh, overcoat, is uh, Nora Cook. And then you can see her husband is in the top row over to the right with the uh, glasses on. That's John Cook. And they were both from the Washington Harbor Village. Um, just next to John are Lily and Joe Johnson, 
who were f- actually from Tseska, the village overlooking the mouth of the Dungeness River, and then they moved to um, Jamestown. They were part of the original uh, settlers of the Jamestown village site in 1874. And then in the bottom right corner, you see Margaret Collier. Um, she and her husband, Robert Collier, were also from the Washington Harbor Village site and moved over to Jamestown in the late 1800s. Um, and interestingly enough, this photo itself was actually taken at Jamestown in uh, 1925 or 1926 during the um, meetings of the Clallam Executive Council, which actually laid out uh, the membership for uh who is recognized as tribal citizens of the Jamestown tribe today. Um, Two more informants, uh, Wilson Johnson here on the left side was actually the son of Joe and Lily Johnson. Joe and Lily Johnson did not speak much, if any, English at all. And so Wilson Johnson was actually their translator. And then he actually relayed a lot of information himself. Um, the image on the right side is Mr. Jimmy Frazier, who is actually um, Salish Songi from Esquimalt over by Victoria on Vancouver Island. Um, the Songis, Sook, and Saanich are all very closely related to the Squalum. They, they speak um, languages that are almost identical. They're dialectically different. Um, they're both straight Salish languages. Um, and the cultural connections are very strong uh, between those two areas. Um, there was an additional informant who I could not find a photo of, Mrs. Robbie Davis, who was actually, um, her father was Elwa uh, from the Chewitzen village site. And then uh, Miss Davis herself actually moved from Elwa. She lived at Dungeness for a while. Then she actually went over and lived um, at the Squalum community at Beecher Bay over on Vancouver Island, and then eventually ended up moving back over um, to the Olympic Peninsula in the 19-teens uh, or 1920s. Um, so I couldn't find a photo of her, but she's also an important informant that I wanted to mention. And uh, what I want to do is just kind of run through some of the different types of uh, information and data that were relayed to Erna Gunther that um, we've found out and have been of hugely of value. Um, and what I wanted to start with is some geographic data and Skalm toponyms. Uh, you can see from this overshot on Google Maps, the red outlined areas are the original uh, Squim Prairies. So it wasn't just one Squim Prairie, there were actually multiple prairies around the Squim area. And what you can see is actually some of those had names in Squalum, and those names were actually references to um, either geographical features of what the landform looked like, or related to um, ethnobotany, what sort of plants they were harvesting at those locations, um, what sort of plant foods were there. Uh, you can see the, the names highlighted in red are village sites. And then there's actually a couple names in there. The areas that are highlighted in bright blue were wetlands on the 1859 GLO maps. And so you can see prior to the hydro modifications that occurred around Squim, over the last 150 years with the irrigation ditches, drainage ditches, uh, etc. Prior to those, there were actually very extensive wetlands around Squim, and those actually were um, very important uh, resources for the Squalum people because they provided um, year-round sources for waterfowl, fishing, um, there's certain uh, uh, wetland plants that grow there like wapato, uh, tule reeds that were used for weaving mats, um, and other plant materials. So those would have been uh, locations of note and they had specific names. Um, I don't speak Squalum, so I'm not gonna try to pronounce these names and, and butcher them up, but uh, it's worth noting, for example, the, um, the name related to the wetland and the beach that's uh, between Three Crabs and Jamestown, that name in Squalum actually basically just says that the beach was the trail. So rather than uh, trying to walk from Jamestown to Dungeness through woods, wetlands, thick forest, etc., the beach itself was the trail. Um, and that's, that's what the name of that beach is, is basically a place to pass through or a place to pass by. Um, you can see just to the east of that, the Squalum name of what's now Grays Marsh Farms, 
Uh, that name is actually related to seagulls and birds and the hunting of seagulls in that area. So there were probably some uh, bird poles out there for harvesting waterfowl. Um, just to the south of that is the name of Gibson Spit, uh, just north of the Chiquing Village site, where we know that there were bird poles for um, harvesting ducks and other waterfowl during the winter. And then at the far north side of this map, you can see the squalum name of Dungeness Spit. Um, and a lot of the spits had, had different names as well. So looking in a little bit closer, uh, I mentioned Joe Johnson is one of the informants for, coming from Tzeskat. You can see Tzeskat marked um, is the village just to the right of the large prairie um, in the top right quadrant of this photo. Um, so the letter C in English and uh, Squalum, that's pronounced t like a T-S sound. So you can see Tzetskat is right there on the bluff overlooking the, the mouth of the Dungeness River. And that was one of the largest and most significant uh, Squalum village sites, as well as Statiflum, which was just to the east of the Dungeness River. You can see the name of that village kind of cut off on the side of the screen. So uh, the reason I wanted to show this map is you can see the villages of Tseska and Tsatsich are located directly onto and adjacent to this large prairie, um, which became known as the Long Prairie when uh, Euro-American settlers arrived. Uh, this prairie was known uh, specifically as a place to harvest uh, fern roots, as well as the prairie located over by Voice of America on the bluffs there um, to the west. Uh, and those are bracken fern roots. So uh, traditionally you would go out and harvest bracken fern roots growing these very long uh, extensive rhizomial mats. So what you would do is using your digging stick, you would go out and pry up these long rhizomes or roots that could be 10, 15, 20 feet long. And the women would roll those up into a bundle, carry those back to the village and you would pound the fern roots down um, into a starchy material that essentially became a type of flour that they would cook into flatbreads and other types of food. Um, it's interesting to note the prairie in the bottom center of this photo, you can see there's one that's got an overlap of a blue circle and a red circle. That's a wet prairie. So on the GLO maps, it's got both the markings of it's an open grassland and it's a wetland. Um, and what that would have been is a camas garden. So Camas itself prefers actually a, you know, Camas can grow in, in drier environments, but in terms of Camas that's actually of a size that uh, would be worth harvesting and cooking for food, tends to grow in a bit of a more uh, wet soil, better soil environment. And that's what you would see in that sort of an area. And that, that old prairie was probably a Camas garden um, 200 years ago. What happened with the arrival of Euro-American settlers um, the first place they arrived was in the Dungeness area was actually on the Long Prairie, which is the long oblong prairie in the top right of this photo. Um, so these Euro-American farmers arrived on their boats, pulled up to shore. There's this nice, big, beautiful open prairie right there um, where they can pull their boats right up. That's where they built their first cabins and started the settlement of Dungeness. So you can imagine what would happen then when the tribal folks went out to do their traditional harvest on the prairies and suddenly there's somebody living there and claiming that land as their own and claiming those plants as their own. Um, it was sort of an immediate source of conflict between the new arrivals and the squalum. Um, and then what followed from that was as these farmers began to settle on these prairies and began to practice Western agricultural practices, they introduced livestock like swine and cattle onto the prairies um, and the native prairie plants didn't stand a chance. You know, when you let swine out on a camas prairie, the first thing they do is go out, dig up all of the bulbs and eat all the camas. Um, also with those introductions of non-native livestock came the introductions of non-native uh, pasture grasses, um, orchard grass, timothy grass, reed canary grass, um, you know, those grasses were used by Western agriculturalists um, because they're, they're, they're very good at what farmers want them for. They're very good at producing lots of uh, 
carbon and biological material for the livestock to eat. However, those same uh, attributes that make them great for farming and Western agriculture also uh, mean that they outcompete our native prairie plants, which are adapted to growing in our rain shadow environment and are much less competitive. Um, our native prairie plants here in the Pacific Northwest tend to grow as bunch plants, which means that you would have a clump of camas and you would have a clump of uh, blue fescue or roamers fescue, and then you would have a clump of lomatium, and you would have sort of these clumps of our native prairie plants and in between those clumps the ground was actually covered with moss similar to what you see when you go up into olympic national forest today with the introduction of the non-native prairie grasses those prairie grasses uh, outcompete those native plants because they fill in all of the spaces between those bunches once those spaces are filled in, our native bunch plants, they don't have a way to proliferate. They don't have a way to spread. Um, and basically they're choked out by the pasture grasses. And so um, probably pretty quick, within a few decades of uh, non-natives arriving, there's a good chance that it only took maybe 30 or 40 years for camas to disappear around uh, squim. We do have a few places where um, our native prickly pear cactus and uh, Lomatium nudicali and a, a few other of those prairie plants are still clinging on around squim, but they're pretty rare. Um, and unfortunately, it's getting harder and harder to find them as development continues. Um, and so I spoke a little bit earlier about how most of Gunther's work was centric to the Washington Harbor Village. This is a good example, um, getting a little bit more in detail with the, the cultural geography in that area. Um, I love this map, which is actually drawn on the inside cover of one of her notebooks, which is basically a map detailing the story of Slapu. Um, and I'm not going to tell the entire story in detail. If you want to read it, um, I highly recommend getting a hold of Bonnie and Brandon at the Tribal Library, um, and they can give you some sources written by uh, Jamestown Tribal Ancestors who wrote up the story of Slapu. Um, but in summary, Slapu was a somewhat Sasquatch-like uh, witch uh, creature person um, who there's, there's lots of different oral histories um, relating to her, stories relating to her. And the one that this is specific to is the story of um, Slapu coming and uh, taking children in her basket and taking them back to where she lived and eventually... Um, because the village didn't want Slapu to do that, there was an old fisherman who uh, offered to paddle Slapu across the bay back to the village. And when she got in his canoe, he paddled her out to the middle of Squim Bay and then tricked her and she fell off the canoe and drowned. And so you can see in the map here in the middle, there's an X that marks the spot of the whirlpool where Slapu drowned. And so to this day, you can still paddle or take a boat out there and there's a specific spot right inside Squim Bay, just inside the entrance to Squim Bay, south of Travis Spit, where the currents coming into Squim Bay through the entrance and then the currents coming out of Squim Bay meet right there at the end of the spit. And it forms a whirlpool where there's constantly bubbles coming up from the bottom. And if you stare down when the water's clear, you can see the eelgrass swaying at the bottom. And that's slap whose hair and the bubbles are her breath as she's down there waiting to come back up. Um, and another interesting thing to note, and it's, it's kind of hard to see with the handwriting on here, but she's actually marked out two areas, one right by the village and then one um, to the north of the Washington Harbor Lagoon. You can kind of see with her scribble there, she's marked them as prairies. And then if you look a little closer, you can see that it's a prairie because the grass was taken by Slapu to caulk a canoe and she pulled the grass and stuffed it into the leaky cracks in the canoe and the trees never grew back there. If you look at the land use map on the right side here, you can actually see that prairie as the yellow oblong shape on the north side of the Washington Harbor Lagoon. And um, of interest, that, that prairie is still there today. If you look at it on Google Maps, it's starting to get overgrown with ironwood and organ grape and some other shrubs. Um, but that prairie is there and we have this really fascinating um, cultural uh, connection to or understanding of why that prairie is in the location it is.
So to talk a little bit more about ethnobotany, I mentioned Camus. Um, this quote by Mary, uh, oh, I got that, her name mixed up there. It should say Mary Hall Hunter Wood. Um, this is the only specific account we have um, from a Jamestown Squalum ancestor of, of Blue Camus in the Squim Dungeness area. So um, this was really, really exciting when we found this. And it's, again, evidence of, you know, Camus was probably gone from the Squim Dungeness area by the early 1900s. So, you know, the reason we don't see it accounted in any of the early Burke or Barium specimen lists from collections around Squim in the 19-teens and 1920s, um, there, there were folks out here collecting plants and sending those to the Burke Herbarium. They did not see Camus, and if it was out there, they would have found it. Um, so for the reasons I previously mentioned, it had probably disappeared. But what Mary told us was there used to be lots of Camus in the prairies around Squim. Women would go out before daylight and would spend all day digging Camus with their ironwood digging sticks come back with just a little basket for a full day's work. Camus bulbs don't get very big. A large, uh, what's called a queen bulb, a bulb that you would actually harvest, take home for cooking and eating, is roughly about the size of your uh, the top knuckle on your thumb. Um, not, not huge. So you can imagine, especially out here in the Pacific Northwest in the dry season with our tough, hard soils, it was not easy work going to dig up Camus. However, it was such a starch-rich, carbohydrate, and sugar-rich food um, that it, it made it was an incredibly important uh, nutrient-rich uh, food source during late winter. What you would do is you would bake, as explained here, bake the camas in a pit for three days and nights, and it essentially bakes it down um, into almost like a gelatin site. Uh, feeling substance that you can then dry out and preserve for late winter. And then in late winter, when you don't have other vegetative uh, plant foods, you can throw that camas in with whatever type of meat you want to cook and have a nice um, sort of well-rounded meal. Um, Lomatium, there's actually a couple different species, um, triticulatum or utriculatum, uh, nudicali, and a few others uh, grow around squim. And uh, Lomation was both an important uh, medicine and it was also an important food source. The seeds were used for medicine. Then the actual leafy greens from Lomation were picked and eaten sort of as salad greens from spring through early summer. And then the root of Lomation itself, it has this very long skinny tap root, very similar to burdock. Um, and it has a very strong celery flavor. Uh, it's actually really delicious. If you ever have a chance to have some baked lomation root or dried lomation root, I, I really enjoy the flavor. Um, and that can still be found in, in some places hanging out around Squim. Another important food source was uh, what the Squalum called their version of wild carrots, known today as Pacific hemlock parsley. Um, and this, again, you know, it, Important food source was found not just here around Squim, but um, in the accounts from Mary Wood, she talks about uh, the Squalum going over to Whidbey Island and Smith Prairie and digging carrots over there. Uh, and Pacific hemlock parsley can also still be found hiding out in a few little spots around Squim. However, I would strongly caution anybody from trying to um, harvest and or eat Pacific hemlock parsley it's extremely similar to poison hemlock. And actually, if you don't have the plants right next to each other, um, they're almost impossible to tell apart. And if you eat poison hemlock, it will kill, kill you. So I would strongly, strongly um, urge caution on anybody considering trying to harvest that. So uh, taking a different tack, but still sort of on an ethnobotany track, um, we have these really beautiful diagrams from Erna. Um, she, basically, what she would do is, as the informants were talking about their weaving techniques, she would have them bring out a basket that she could sketch. And you can see that um, these, the weaving patterns that she was diagramming here are very specific to Jamestown. The different tribal communities or the, the, more specifically, the women in different tribal communities would have different weaving patterns that they would pass down from generation to generation. 
and at Jamestown, that weaving pattern is is sort of a, a checkerboard um, where the and I'm I am not a weaver, so I'm I'm going to get the terminology probably totally wrong here, but the warps and the wafts are um, at 90 degree angles from each other. So uh, it basically, if you look at the basket over on the left side at the very bottom of it, you can see sort of a checkerboard pattern. Um, the, the older Jamestown baskets that the Jamestown tribe has in their collections passed down from the ancestors are of that um, very uh, straight checkerboard pattern. Um, and so there would have been many different types of baskets. You had carrying baskets, um, berry harvesting baskets. You would have clam baskets, which is um, the open weave shown on the bottom left. That would have been done for a clam basket. And the reason for that is when you were out harvesting, you know, digging clams out on the mud flat, you would take your basket with you. As you dig up clams, you toss them in your basket. And with that open weave, the, the water slowly drains out, and then before you head back to the beach, you can sort of dip that basket in the water a couple times, rinse your clams off, and then let the water drain out of the basket and out of the clams as you walk back to your cooking site. Uh, another interesting note from Mary Wood, if you look at the Sklalem or Klalem calendar today, there is a full Squalum calendar that's 12 months long. However, some of those names, um, if, you, if you sort of research into them, uh, some of those names are sort of references to more contemporary um, I don't know what the best way to say it. Basically, the, the traditional Squalum calendar was entirely oriented around what resources were available and what environmental factors um, were giving cues to um, giving cues to individuals on, on the seasonality. And so I, I, I really like these quotes because it helps give people a better understanding of exactly how in tune the Squalum were with their environment and with what was going on with the, wor the world around them. Um, and so a great example is the name for the month of June in the Squalum calendar is actually a reference to when the wild geese fly from Vancouver Island over, fly from here over to Vancouver Island to dig seeds on the prairie. And around that time is when uh, thunder would start. Um, one interesting thing to note, you know, in interviews with tribal ancestors in the 1800s, um, one thing that comes up incredibly frequently was um, thunder. And actually, Squalum warriors were known for their thunder power, which was a, a very great spiritual power given to them um, and that they would use during wartime. And so, for example, um, it was known, you know, when the Squalum were going to war, they would call upon that power and, and thunder would come from the sky, from Thunderbird. Um, then, you know, it's interesting now listening to accounts from tribal elders today who still have memories from their youth of relatively frequent thunderstorms during the, the summer months out here. Um, I've lived here on the Olympic Peninsula for six years and I've heard thunder twice. Um, so when we talk about, you know, climate change and the realities of that happening, we can actually see it culturally documented um, in these accounts of frequent thunder happening in the past and now um, thunder's almost unknown some years here on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, the month of September was actually related to the fact that all of the squalum, at least from uh, the eastern Olympic Peninsula, would actually pack up into their canoes, paddle down to the Hood Canal, and go fishing for salmon in September. Um, and so that was what that month was known as. Fishing. Uh, you can see this beautiful sketch of a fishing spear on the right side of the image. And the way that that would have been used is um, the Squalum built fish weirs that stretched in the entire way across the river or creek. And those would have a platform or a walkway on top of them. And what you would do is you would walk out onto your platform, 
lower your pole into the water and spear those salmon out uh, for harvesting. Um, in Erna Gunther's accounts, we have this really interesting quote um, that uh, the fish trap on the Dungeness River, there was a trap either below or above the steel bridge near the present schoolhouse. So that the present schoolhouse is what we know now today as the old Dungeness schoolhouse, which is right next to the bridge over the Dungeness River in the Dungeness community. That was the location of the first fish trap and then there were additional fish traps upstream from that, roughly um, spaced out, you know, 50 feet or more. The reason the fish traps were in that location is because you've got a natural choke point. That bridge crosses from one part of a ridge to another part of a ridge that the Dungeness River actually broke through sometime in the late 1840s or 1850s. The Dungeness River shifted from uh, the Meadow Brook Creek Channel into its current alignment that cuts through that ridge, that makes a really nice choke point. You've got a nice skinny area where your fish trap doesn't have to be super large. The river is not extremely deep there. Um, and it's very close to the Tetscat village site. So it's kind of the, the primary hotspot for fishing for salmon on the Dungeness. So the first trap on the river would have been owned by the um, family with the, uh, let's say, um, most formal or senior rights to fishing on the river. And then um, by line of, of where families were in seniority and sort of social and economic ranking would own fish traps going upstream from there. Because obviously the lower fish trap is going to catch the most salmon. The next fish trap upstream will catch the next highest amount of salmon and, and as you go upstream. Um, but it's worth noting that each of those fish weirs had an escapement uh, area that so that a certain number of fish could always escape upstream. There was no way, they would never block all of the salmon from getting upstream. Um, that first fish trap on the Dungeness River was owned by Wahulasut, who was the uncle of Robert Collier, who I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Um, uncle of uh, Robert Collier's mother, and he was also the uncle of Henry and Frank Allen, who uh, their mother was the Dungeness Squalum. She married a gentleman from Skokomish, and she actually moved down there and lived on the Skokomish Reservation, as did Henry and Frank. Um, and we have really great detailed accounts from the Dungeness Squalum rela rela uh, relayed by Henry and Frank Allen in a book by William Elmendorf called The Tuana Narratives. And I highly, highly recommend that as a resource for anybody um, interested in learning more about um, Squalum history and ethnography and, and all of this stuff. Um, another really cool thing is we have a picture of Wahula suit. Um, this picture was taken um, sometime around 1900s. And it says, you know, in the scribbling on the verso of the image, that he was around 100 years old when this photo was taken. Um, and that makes sense. We see him in census records um, up through the 1890s. It's unclear exactly how old he was at that time because he was born in the early 1800s um, and there weren't any records kept at that time. Um, however, uh, despite owning uh, the primary, the largest fish trap on the Dungeness River and, and of being of this noble lineage, um, for whatever reason, Wulusut never moved to Jamestown. He never purchased property at Jamestown. Um, so there's pictures of him from the Dungeness area in the late 1800s to early 1900s. And he uh, basically disappears from the census records and other records by 1904. So he probably passed away sometime um, in that time. But he was a, a very significant medicine man for the Squalum people, one of the last medicine men. Um, and in Elmendorf's accounts, there's uh, specific and very detailed accounts of some of the um, medicinal ceremonies and healings that um, Wakulasut did uh, for Squalum tribal members. Another uh, some other great information that we have in Erna Gunther's uh, field notebooks are accounts of Squalum potlatches. Um, so Robert Collier actually, and it gives a, a lot of 
generalized information on a, on potlatches saying that basically, uh, if, if not more frequently, one would have been held at least every other year at Washington Harbor. Um, you know, they would have had one on intervening years for significant events, say, um, the naming of your first son or a marriage or the birth of a child. Um, significant life events like that would also prompt a potlatch. But then um, every other year would be a um, Zunzanite, which was the secret society, the Black Temenua secret society um, would prompt a, a potlatch every other year. Uh, invitations would have been sent out to tribes all around the Salish Sea. Um, not just uh, other Squalm tribal communities. The image on the left side of your screen is actually from a watercolor done by James Swan, and it's showing the inside of Chich Chief Chichmahan or Chetsamoka's potlatch house at Katai or Port Townsend in the 1850s um, when he was hosting a potlatch there. And so you can see uh, in this image, uh, lots of folks have the red Temenuas, uh, red, uh, Tmenos or uh, red medicine uh, face paint on their faces. You can see um, the shaman and uh, dancers in the circle in the middle there. And then uh, the woman in the blue dress is Jenny Lind, who is uh, Cheech Mahan's second wife. His younger wife, uh, Chilil, is her Squalam name. And she's distributing potlatch gifts to women sitting in a circle uh, around the outside while the men dance. Just a really cool, cool picture. Um, potlatches would last up to one week, um, and it would start with a series of uh, feasts. Different folks in the village that was hosting the potlatch would host a feast at their home. I know so every day uh, a different individual would host a feast and give away some potlatch goods, and then at the end would be, uh, you know, whoever the primary host was who sent out the invitations would throw the, the big shindig there for the last day or two. Um, another really interesting thing that we have in Erna Gunther's field notes, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, her information in the Qalam ethnography is very generalized, and it doesn't really mention other than in her little acknowledgement statement, it doesn't mention any individual, any tribal individuals or their histories. Um, one of the great things about doing this research is it's actually helped us backtrack through tribal genealogies going back as far as the early 1800s and maybe the late 1700s and not just getting names of individuals but but finding out real life events that happened to these individuals 200 years ago um, and the reason we have this information is it was relayed to an er Erna Gunther directly from the descendants of those individuals that you're naming. And so um, these next three slides, I'm going to focus specifically on John Cook. Um, so I mentioned earlier, John Cook and his family were from the Washington Harbor Village site. Um, Zalskanem, who is the last chief of Shtequing, he was Cook's grandmother's cousin um, through her brother's son. And he passed away um, in probably around 1888, 1887. Um, and after he passed away, there was no new chief. Essentially, by, by the time Zalskanem passed away, the Shtequing village site had gone from um, probably 150 to 200 individuals uh, as a result of su uh, successive epidemics coming in. Um, and impacting the village by the 1880s there were there were about 40 people left and so when Zalskanem died at that point the the village as a socio-political unit sort of disintegrated and those families the majority of those families still remaining at that village site moved to Jamestown by 1894. Um, there were a couple individuals who remained at the village site and continue to work for the buggy clam cannery, but we covered that in a different presentation, so I won't jump on that soapbox today. Um, but if you look on the right side here in this little genealogical chart that I had handwritten, you'll see the name of Cookhouse Johnny, aka John Cook, was Yak Yaktun. And what's great about that is we actually have in Erna Gunther's accounts 
these amazing stories that Yak Yakton passed down to John Cook, um, this story is actually the account from when the Sklalem first saw white people. Um, and I'm not going to read it verbatim, but there were a couple of things that I wanted to note in here um, because I think that they're really telling um, about, you know, sort of some of the current misconceptions about what life was like back then and what um, perceptions were like of Euro-Americans by natives and vice versa. Um, so in this account, uh, a woman went out to uh, Dungeness on the hill, probably around Seskat on the bluff over the Dungeness River, and saw a ship. She informed the folks in the village. The men painted their fa uh, faces, put on feathers, and began to do a dance. Uh, when the vessel sailed into Dungeness Bay, they paddled out in a canoe, and then they saw that there were people on it. So they realized, okay, well, this is a boat with... Um, the people that a gentleman had actually had a dream about white people arriving. So um, the chief went out in a canoe and then a second canoe went out with Indian potatoes. And the Indian potatoes are an interesting reference. That could be camas, it could be wapato um, or arrowroot. I'm not sure at this time. But either way, they took a couple baskets out of Indian potatoes to the ship um, and of course, you know, the Euro-Americans on the ship, they had been at sea for months, so um, they were stoked to get some fresh produce on the boat. Uh, but what's interesting here is um, when they bought the potatoes from the Sklalem, they first tried to pay with a gold piece, but the Sklalem wouldn't take it. They specifically wanted iron fish hooks. Well, how would they know about iron fish hooks? Shockingly, the Sklalem and other tribes in the Pacific Northwest had actually had access to metals like iron and copper long before Europeans arrived in this corner of the world. Um, and there's, there's a couple different theories on, on where and how that might have come from. Copper, we know specifically, was, um, was mined by tribes and hammered out into copper sheets. Um, the iron, we believe, probably came from uh, shipwrecks of Chinese and Japanese junks that washed across the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that, that occurred on into the historic era. And, and there's accounts, um, especially out uh, at the Macaw tribe um, and out on the west end of the Olympic Peninsula of those junks washing in through the, the 17 and 1800s. And uh, the Macaw actually rescued a couple uh, Japanese fishermen at one point who, who made it all the way back to Japan. And when you walk into the uh, Macaw uh, Culture Center out there at Nia Bay, one of the first things you'll see when you walk in the front door is this giant, beautiful, probably four or five foot long um, replica model of one of those junks that was pushed all the way across the Pacific Ocean. Um, and you can think of it in a more contemporary era uh, when the uh, tsunami happened uh, over in Japan a couple years ago and wiped out the Fukushima power plant. A ton of material ended up washing up on our shores, you know, months to years later from that tsunami on the other side of the ocean. That's been occurring for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so there definitely would have been times over the last couple hundred years where a ship would wash up out on the coast that would have had iron nails and iron fish hooks and iron implements that the tribes would have immediately salvaged and used for their own. So that's where, you know, when, when the Euro-American ships arrived this far down the straits, it was the first time that the natives, the native Sklalems had encountered Euro-Americans on white people on a ship but it wasn't the first time that they had encountered metal and they knew what they wanted and they knew what they needed. They were very savvy traders. Um, so the next, the, the Euro-American traders tried, showed them a shirt and they uh, traded the shirt for two baskets of potato. And I love this next line. The white showed them hard tack. The white man ate some, but the Indian, Indians would not touch it. Um, if any of you have ever tried hardtack or seen it, it's not hard to understand why. It's a bit like eating cardboard. It's not very appetizing stuff. Um, they also wouldn't take any rice or beans. 
you can imagine if you have access to your traditional uh, food sources that are uh, fresh and much more to your palate, um, you know, looking at a, a dry uh, food product like rice or something probably doesn't look very appetizing. Um, they did want matches. You know, you saw the practicality immediately of if somebody lights a match, you've got transportable fire. Um, they divided a can of paint amongst all of the families and got some black handkerchiefs. Um, the next day, the tribe went back out with more baskets full of potatoes and they refused to take any groceries for the potatoes. They only wanted shirts and pants. Um, so I think it's just an interesting account. Um, you know, this happened when John Cook's father was a little boy, which puts that sometime in the very late 1700s or more, more correctly, probably early, early 1800s. Uh, that picture on the right side is John Cook. And one more story uh, about John Cook's father, Yak Yak Tun. Um, this is a story about when the Sklalem went to war with the Duwamish tribe over by Seattle. And the reason they went to war was the Duwamish had actually captured John Cook's father, Yak Yak Tun, and taken him as a slave back to the White River. So the Sklalem from Elwha, Port Angeles, Dungeness, and Discovery Bay got together and sent seven canoes over to the White River to recapture John Cook's father. Um, and we have this really great detailed account of exactly how that occurred. They paddled up river. They actually used some subterfuge by um, hiding most of the canoes and then just having one canoe with two guys visible um, sitting up eating clams. So uh, when some Duwamish came down the river, they saw these two guys eating clams in a canoe. They paddled up. And then, uh, so long story short, they ended up uh, capturing, they, they found the village, they found the child. When they confirmed that it was the child who'd been captured as a slave and they captured him back, then they attacked the village um, and they uh, made it home. So I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, please join us next month at Oct on October 14th at 3 p.m. for a virtual tour of the Jamestown Squalum Tribal Museum and Archival Collections. Um, the tribe has thousands of amazing artifacts, ethnographic objects, archival records and documents, um, which for years have been um, stored in a climate-controlled, secure storage room um, owned by the tribe. Um, however, we're really excited to um, start getting the word out because we're, the, the Jamestown tribe is actually in the process of closing and expanding the Jamestown Tribal Library. When the Tribal Library reopens next fall, hopefully in uh, August or September of 2022, we're gonna, there's gonna be a beautiful exhibit space in there where we're gonna be able to display some of these objects. But if you want sort of a, a preview sneak peek, please join us on the 14th. So uh, thank you all very, very much for joining us. Um, if you want more information or would like to check out um, other presentations that we've given that are, pre are recorded, please visit uh, the Jamestown Tribal Library website at library.jamestowntribe.org. If you go over to the events tab, you'll see um, information on future presentations and events. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll also see links um, that will take you to the previously recorded uh, presentations. Or you can go on YouTube and just search for JST Library, go to the Jamestown Library's YouTube page. Um, our recorded presentations are there as well. Um, also, we would love for you to support the North Olympic History Center. We're always welcoming new members. Um, we're always welcoming new volunteers. We would not get anywhere without volunteers. They run this show. Um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be getting by. Um, or if you just want to make a donation, um, you can check us out on our website, clallamhistoricalsociety.com, or on our Facebook page for more information.